Our laptop driver's going to be way too loud for this, isn't it? The end of May 1996. If you're me, you're one years old, and you're probably covered in ice cream. But for everyone, it was the last month anyone would ever go without Animorphs. Over the next six years, over 54 Animorphs books were published, along with a spin-off series and a TV show that ran from 1998 to 2000. 23 years on from the first book originally being published, I want to read every single Animorphs book, and because it's 2019 and I have a YouTube channel, I'm going to bring you along with me. So a little backstory, I read some of the Animorphs in around 2008 when I was in secondary school, uh, but somebody always had the one that I wanted to read next, so I read them incredibly out of order, and I don't remember which ones I have and haven't read. So basically I'm reading these for the first time? I am, as should you be, incredibly excited. Book one, The Invasion, published in June. 1996. First let's start off with the cover because I think that you should always judge a book by its cover and this book looks amazing. What I really love is how there's a normal picture of a 90s child and then immediately they just bail. It, straight away it's terrifying computer face and no blending in between and we go all the way through to Lizard but that person will be haunting your dreams. That right there is a sign of something awesome to come. I genuinely don't know if the quality of covers improves throughout the series I, I hope it doesn't, I assume it does. I want to talk about the masterful opening. So each Animorphs book starts very similarly. Uh, they're all narrated by a different character. This first book, the first character we meet is Jake and the first thing he tells us is that he can't tell us his last name or where he is uh, because otherwise they might get him. And it's just so perfect within those first three sentences, you know everything you need to know about this book. I can't imagine what it's like to read these not knowing anything about the concept other than terrifying lizard face. So we meet our characters, which consist of Jake, who's telling this story, Marco, who's Jake's pal. All we know about him at this stage is that he is good at analysing and playing video games. So obviously he's going to be a real asset. Tobias, who is the new kid in school and is being bullied for being different. Mm -hmm. Rachel, I can't do four fingers. Ra Rachel, who is Jake's cousin and is described as clean and wholesome. Cassie, who's described as the opposite of Rachel. Uh, now, I think this is a slightly problematic statement because the opposite of clean and wholesome implies not that. And Cassie is also black. Uh, so let's just take a moment to remember that these books are from the 90s and we're going to come across very many problematic things. Problematic pause. Jake likes Cassie. Uh, in a semi-romantic way it's implied, largely I think because the other eligible female character in this book is his cousin uh, and you know it's the 90s not the 1790s. The gang decide to take a quick shortcut home through the abandoned construction lot uh, because it's the 90s nobody stops them uh, and they, they're on their way walking when suddenly there's a UFO. As happens to all of us, it's an ordinary tale of everyday people. A telepathic alien comes out who is very clearly dying and reveals that they're called the Andalites, these blue aliens with funny eye horns, uh, and says, there are, there are worse aliens coming. I, I was here to protect you. Why they believe him in this, I really don't know. And maybe it's just my instinct saying like, what are, what, how do I know you're not here to attack me? Anyway. And he says there's some terrifying aliens coming, they're called the Yerks. And the Yerks are the villains in this piece. Uh, and they're basically slugs that live inside people's brains and they possess them. Uh, one thing I want to know is that other than take over the world, it's not really clear what the Yerks want to do. Uh, and I think that will become a common theme in the coming books that all we know is that the Yerks like taking over people, but we don't really know why. The Andalite alien offers them the power to morph, which unsurprisingly is basically the concept of this book and it says you know and it's a big power it's a big responsibility but i don't know when the other andalites are coming and somebody's got to protect the earth so it may as well be you guys uh even though your children and you know that seems immoral but because these books are great the gang will say hang on let's have a think for a moment because we should probably all consent to having these powers and apparently there was no option for one of them to have them and the others to not they all had to have them uh, so they, they're like, okay, we'll think about it. But then suddenly the Yerks are coming and there's no time to think, there's no time to stop. So they're just like, okay, give us those mighty Morphin powers. It's going to be great. They learn that they'll be able to map the DNA of any creature uh, and then they'll be able to transform into it. And the Andalite gives them the one rule. And I'm going to read this verbatim because I think it's important that we're all clear on the one rule. Okay, only remember this. Never remain in animal form for more than two of your Earth hours. Never. 
That is the greatest danger of the morphing. If you stay longer than two hours, you will be trapped, unable to return to human form. I'm sure that they will follow this very simple rule. The Yerks are here. Most importantly, Vissa 3 is here. And Vissa 3 is the big bad. He's the real villain of this piece. He's the worst of the Yerks. And he's also the only Yerk who's ever managed to take over an Andalite body. So he can also morph. While these kids have only had their powers for five seconds, he's been traveling all around the universe. He has alien DNA all up in there and he's ready to transform into some horrifying stuff, which we find out because he immediately turns into a horrifying beast and eats the Andalite. Yes. We're at chapter seven of this definitely, definitely a children's book. The children run away because obviously they run away. Uh, and then the next day that evening, timing, I'm not the best on covering. Tobias turns up at Jake's house and he's like, okay, I know you're deeply in denial that any of this happened and you probably think it was a dream because this is a, that kind of a book. Uh, but I turned into my cat. His cat, by the way, is called Dude. Um, animal names in this book are increasingly amusing, but the cat is called Dude. Uh, and Jake says, oh, no, 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 it's not. You didn't turn into your cat. You just had a hard day. And so Tobias does what any of us would do and turns into his cat in front of Jake because these books are great. Uh, and it's pretty, pretty damning evidence. Also, they have telepathy now. So I forgot to mention the Andalites speaking to them in their minds. Uh, and now they have telepathy, basically, I think, to get around the difficult plot point of some animals not having mouths that can vocalise. So... If you're in animal form, you can telepathically communicate with any of the five of them. Uh, but if you're you're an animal and they're a person, they can't communicate back. They can just hear you. This is very important. They can telepathically communicate. How you know these books are great is that the first thing that Tobias wants when he turns into a cat is like, Jake, pull the string. I think it will be fun. And I think these books do a really good job of explaining how unhelpful actual animals would be in these situations. Uh, so it's like life or death, there's an alien invasion coming. He's like, yes, let's play cat game. But then it's all too much and the cat brain starts to take over and we get another limitation on this amazing power. And that's this balance between the human brain and that animal kind of instinctual brain, which is a huge plot point in basically every single one of these books. It's them harnessing that power. So then Tobias makes Jake the leader. Uh, no one else is there at this point, and I'm pretty sure they should have consulted some other people, but Tobias says this. Yes, Jake, you are our leader. You're the one who can bring us all together and help us defeat the controllers. We have the ability to be so much more than we are, to have the stealth of a cat, and, and the eyes of eagles, and the sense of smell of a dog, and the speed of a horse or a cheetah. We're going to need it all if we have any hope of holding out against the controllers. He's not wrong! but there's no reason Jake has to be the leader in this scenario. But Jake's been pretty convinced because every man likes people talking them up uh, and he decides to become his dog, who's called Homer. I don't think he's named after the Greek poet. Now fully convinced, the two of them head off to meet the others. They decide to go to Cassie's uh, and we find out very importantly that Cassie has a hookup at the zoo. This is hugely, my laptop is being so loud. This is hugely important because I can imagine the difficulty of suddenly getting these powers and being like, well, I really need to turn into a giraffe, but you're just like stuck in Shrewsbury or something. Uh, so Cassie's a horse. This is where we learn that Cassie is the best because Cassie morphs out of horse form because there are policemen turning up. Uh, so they all sort of like stand on, in the way and stop them from seeing the half horse woman. So Cassie morphs back and she's wearing skin tight lightroom because Cassie has figured out that you can morph in clothes, whereas the boys have just been morphed naked. You can morph in clothes, but they have to be tight. I don't know what the science of that is, and I'm not gonna think about it too hard because the other option was to have these children turning up everywhere naked, and that feels like a plot point that we don't need to go through. Let's just have everyone assume that they're starting like a bobsled team or something. So it becomes clear that some of the police officers in this place are also yicks, uh, and it's all starting to feel a little bit like that bit in the Transformers film where all the police vehicles turn up and they're all actually the Decepticons. Uh, I, there's quite a lot of crossover between this and Transformers. I mean, what can I say? Aliens turn to Earth, recruit teenagers, call powers. I mean, this is where my teen heart really falls for Tobias. I love him. Uh, I just want him to be okay. Meanwhile, some of the other characters, including Jake's older brother, Tom, who was on the basketball team, but has left the basketball team drama because he has joined something called The Sharing, which when reading it the first time, uh, I was basically like, well, this is either a cult or a Christian youth group. 
Uh, and, you know, sometimes there isn't that much difference between the two. But he's basically saying, oh, brother of mine, you should join the sharing. It's all very nice there. And we're, we're all sharing things. And, and my brain's going, it's cold, it's cold, run away. Meanwhile, the gang is deciding, should we use these powers? Should we be trying to do anything for the planet? Or do we just kind of roll over and let these yerks come in? We're teenagers, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, and Cassie makes the very good point that they should wait and think about it because, and I quote, this is a big decision. I mean, it's not like we're deciding whether to wear jeans or a skirt. That's right, Cassie. Plot happens, and oh no, Tom might be a controller. Uh, controllers are where you have the yik inside you, controlling you, but they're called controllers. No, uh, Tom might be a controller. Everyone but Jake, who is deeply in denial for much of this book. It's all about just convincing Jake that things are happening. Uh, everyone but Jake's like, yeah, yeah, Tom's probably a controller, my friend. And he's like, no, he's my brother. Everything will be fine. We also get the first warning of Tobias wanting to stay in his hawk form for too long, because we definitely set up that they're all definitely going to follow that two hour rule. Oh, and Tobias has slightly more information than everyone else, because while everyone else was running for their lives, Tobias stayed with the dying Andalite for a little bit longer uh, and was kind of like, oh, give me some visions. And the Andalite gave them some visions. So now they know way more about the Andal Andalites and the Yiks, uh, and they're like, we need to find the Yik pool uh, where they're dunking people in to put Yiks in their brains. Uh, so everyone's like, oh, okay, we seem to have decided to do that now, so that's fine, we'll do that. So the plan is to find the Yik pool and to blow it up. That's their plan, that's the specifics of it, uh, and they decide that the best way to do this is to go spy on the sharing meeting, because apparently they've decided if it looks like a cult, walks like a cult, it's probably a cult. It's definitely a cult. So they get there, uh, which is a meeting happening on the beach, and there's another like separate full associates meeting happening, which are definitely the people being controlled by slum. And they say, oh, how can we join? They say, oh, well, you have to be approved to be that kind of a member. So there is, they're not going to be able to go sit in on the secret spy meeting that easily. So Jake has to become his dog self. Uh, but also still sneak around because otherwise Tom will just see that his childhood dog is there and they discover the big plot to reveal the assistant principal Chapman is a controller uh, and I find this quite you know it's a 90s book obviously everyone in a position of authority is the worst but also what a specific level of authority I know very little about American high schools but I go for the principal, surely, or has the assistant principal got more power? I don't know. Comment below if you know. And Tom, who is a controller, by the way, uh, reveals that Jake and his friends are there because they're either going to convert them into the sharing yerky time, or they're just going to kill them. My camera decided to run out of memory, so if this angle has shifted, I apologise. They immediately say, actually, no. no we, we were going to kill them, but it'll be a bit suspicious if, if the bunch of teenagers who are, are definitely not a cult meeting die immediately. Uh, so let's... Let's kill them later, uh, maybe, and so the gang have time to run. It's time to morph into even more spy -y creatures. It's lizard time. So they use Cassie's hookup, get some lizard DNA, uh, and Jake becomes a lizard in the school, which is one of my most favourite lines from this entire book, and I'm going to read it to you. I did it. Monday morning, in my locker at school, I turned into a lizard, a green anole to be exact. It's a member of the iguana family, like you care. I do care, Jake. Teach me about the animals. But also, why have you done this in your locker at school? Like, you haven't tested these powers that much yet. What if you tried to turn into a lizard, but you turned into like a half man, half lizard, and were also kind of naked, just in your locker? What would happen? I need to know why you're making these choices. In the most 90s science fiction moment ever, the entrance to the pool is under the school. So they all agree that their current morphs are a bit mad, so they need to go feel up some other animals. So they're using Cassie's hookup at the zoo. There is an on-page moment where they're discussing the price of the zoo and how much they're each going to have to pay to get in, and Marco coins the term animorphs, so I can now stop calling them the gang and start calling them the animorphs. But in this discussion of what animals they're going to get, Tobias still just wants to be a hawk, which I respect and I love him, but at the same time I can't really relate to not wanting to be a polar bear. Like, you can be a hawk some of the time. But give yourself options. Open doors for yourself, Tobias. Marco grabs some gorilla DNA. Uh, Jake and Marco end up stuck in the tiger enclosure through a hilarious wrong door scenario worthy of a Scooby-Doo episode if Jake had been in dog form. They've grabbed their DNA. We don't know what DNA the girls got, but they've gone home. We learn a bit more about Jake. We learn that he does not like broccoli and that his parents don't like him hanging out. 
that's the extent of what we know about him so far. Big plot drop again because this book is not very long so they come quite thick and fast. Cassie's gone missing. The controllers have Cassie. They need to break into the school to get Cassie back from the controllers. So they go in, sneak into the basement, sneak down to the yerk pool, except it's not just a yerk pool, it's a whole city full of yerks. Uh, it's like an underground cavernous, there's a pool, there's human beings in cages. What is this done for the structural soundness of the city and everything above? We don't know. Then the rescue mission happens. Uh, Rachel becomes an elephant and just tramples a bunch of people because she's the best. Jake becomes a tiger, Marco becomes a gorilla. There's a whole thing. So Cassie's freed. Uh, and, but then she has to become a horse again, which feels unfair, and I don't I don't know if they gave her a cool other morph. It's never explained, but you know, everyone else got to be cool zoo animals. Why does she have to be a horse again? Visser 3 turns up, and he becomes a terrifying eight-headed, eight-legged spider beast that also can breathe fire, and it's, it's just the worst, but they're escaping. And then Brother Tom throws himself in front of the tiger that is his brother, but he doesn't know it's his brother because he's like fighting the yik mind and the yik's wearing off because they've got to dunk him back in the pool uh, and he's there and he's a brother and he's brave and strong and he's he saves him even though he doesn't know who it is and they all escape. They escape having managed to save Cassie and one other woman so it's like a moderate success. We're only on book one. They're not superheroes yet. And then it's kind of the end of the book. Um, Tom's a controller again. Uh, he has no idea that it was his brother he saved because they think that the Animorphs are actually Andalites um, because they've never seen them out of Morph. But the big plot twist at the end of this book is that you saw it coming, Tobias hid in the cave in hawk form for too long and he's now stuck as a hawk and Jake's really sad for him. I personally feel like Tobias clearly wanted to be a hawk, maybe we should respect that, but you know, I'm, I'm not the leader. Neither are you, Jake. So the Animorphs decide that they're going to wait for the rest of the Andalites to come, and in the meantime, they're going to do their best to keep defending the Earth. It's a great ending to book one. I thought it would be fun to kind of start making a tally of what morphs we get, so I want to go through the morphs we get in this book. We get cat, dog, horse, hawk, lizard, tiger, elephant, gorilla. More action, more adventure, more hilarious misunderstandings that lead to people being in peril, be sure to subscribe so that you can see me go through the next book in the series of Animorphs.